Good afternoon. This morning you heard about the HIE landscape in Michigan from four of our health information exchanges. Now you're going to hear what's going on nationally. You remember Doug Dietzman talked about 45 HIEs that are uh, sustainable and successful nationally. Well, we've got some of the most successful uh, efforts from across the U.S. Um, Maine, you heard Sean Alfords on SIM yesterday. You're going to he hear him on Health Info Net today. You're going to hear Daryl Holler from the New York eHealth Collaborative. Now, that's pronounced nice. And the equivalent of my hen in New York is the State Health Information Network of New York. And that is pronounced shiny. So the uh, Madison Avenue folks came up with nice and shiny for, for New York. And I love it. I've always loved that. That's great, Daryl. Um, we have uh, Dr. Robert Rim Cothran from the um, California Association of Health Information Exchanges and um, Aaron Seib from the National Association of Trusted Exchanges. I'm going to spare you my bad reading day on the bios. You can read the bios in the program. We're going to give more speaker time and we're going to begin with Sean Alfreds from Maine, the Chief Operating Officer of Health InfoNet. Thank you, and thank you all for having us here today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to present on all the great things we're doing in Maine and um, the opportunities we have ahead of us. Um, I also really appreciate the, the opportunity to learn from you all. Um, you're doing some amazing things here in Michigan, um, um, things that I'm, I take home every time I come to this conference and say, you know what, they've, they've, got, it, they've got it going on over there, and we've got to bring it home. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Health InfoNet today. Um, I've talked about SIM yesterday and what we're doing on that. So some of this stuff will be a little repetitious, but I'm going to go over it quick. Um, this is a map of Maine. Uh, Maine's a really big geographic state. Um, all of the New England states can fit into Maine and still have room for the Great North Woods. Um, but we only have 1.3 million people. So we're very rural, um, lots of last mile connections. Um, this map shows where we're at today. We've got 100% we've got hospital penetration. The final two hospitals are just uh, literally in, in production validation. We've got all of the federally qualified health centers at least viewing information, and most of them are bidirectionally connected. And we've got over 450 ambulatory practices um, connected. This is a picture from our, web, my, our website. You can go there, um, www.hinfonet.org, um, and actually see actively our production stats today. Um, that first number in there, it says inbound clinical messages received today. That's a ticker. You're seeing, you're seeing it in real time as we get clinical messages. That, that, that's a counter, and it counts all the messages that we're getting. And then the stats below it are summarized um, um, to the month. So if you want to see what's happening in Health Infonet in real time, go to the website. Um, on a general basis, we get about, we're, we're a little bit smaller than, than Great Lakes, but we're designed fairly similarly in, in, in the way in which we work with our provider organizations. Um, we, have, we have proliferated HL7 messaging between all of our, our bi-directional um, uh, participants. We get about 15 and a half million inbound messages a month. Um, three and 300,000 uh, messages are sent outbound in support of ACO management. We do a lot of data uh, sharing back to ACOs. Um, we do about 40,000 transmissions a month to our main CDC or Department of Public Health for all of the same things that we heard about this morning, syndromic surveillance, laboratory reporting, and immunizations. Um, we have about 25,000 patients looked up in the HIE portal every month, and that is continuously increasing. It has increased every single month since I started Health InfoNet over five years ago. Um, we have about 10,000 real-time patient encounter notifications right now um, set up. We do both um, secured PHI notifications and unsecured non-PHI notifications um, to, to organizations um, across the state of Maine. And our data is just growing and getting bigger all the time. Um, this is sort of a quick portfolio of services. Again, you've heard, heard this from Great Lakes. We do a lot of similar things. We provide the health information exchange functions. We provide enterprise master person index services back down to clients. So client, client organizations, as, as, as many of you know, have multiple IT systems and need a, a single patient identifier or medical record number. We provide that back down to clients so that they can use that and not have to purchase an EMPI on their own. Um, we provide notification services. Like I said, we're doing that in real time for many, many different conditions. And I've talked about that before you, um, with you all, and I can talk about that in questions later, but I want to get down to some of the other um, new services that we're providing. 
Um, as I said, automated laboratory reporting, syndromic surveillance. We have nine ACOs in our small state right now, and um, what, we're what we've developed is a service whereby they all, where they can actually request data of us and send us in real time or send us a monthly list of their membership. Um, we'll tag them in our EMPI, and then any time those patients have events, we will send over the ADT and clinical messaging to them directly for incorporation in their own internal data systems. And then um, I presented last year, and I actually gave a demo of our analytics service. Um, we're, we're very deep in, in analytics now. Uh, we are a centralized data repository model, HIE, which gives us, right today, we've got over 1.4 million patients in our ER EMPI longitudinally for about six years on the clinical side. And um, now this year, we started taking in claims data. Um, we brought in four years of longitudinal, longitudinal fully identified claims data from Medicaid for about 450,000 patients. Uh, that's getting pulled into our data repository, and we're using that data um, to provide both descriptive and predictive analytics out to clients. Um, I want to talk about some new projects that we're doing. Um, certainly what came up yesterday when we heard um, um, from about DOD and VA, um, we have now fully connected to the VA in Maine. Um, this year, we, um, just recently, we went live in getting all the VA practices um, um, an access point to our HIE portal. So we have one, v one hospital, uh, Togus Hospital in Maine, and then we have nine clinical practices that are, that are operating across the state from northern Maine, the tip of northern Maine, all the way to the New Hampshire border in the south. And so we're getting those practices access to our HIE portal. And the reason why we're do getting them access to our HIE portal is because there's a lot more information in our HIE portal than we can produce and put into a CCD. Um, we have a lot of documentation data. Um, we have a lot more clinical information than, than can be brought forward through the C32 format. Um, so there, and and when, when we started the project and talking to VA over five years ago, they said, look, we, we love our systems. We love our, our virtual lifetime electronic health record. It is challenging for line staff to be able to access that because it's five clicks down to go pull out a, a document from another, pro another provider that's participating in the Veeler system. Um, so they asked us if we'd be willing to try that. And um, luckily, we were able to receive a grant from HRSA to fund this activity. So that's live. In April, we had over 800 um, unique HIE veterans records accessed by VA clinicians on site. Um, and um, secondly, we are connecting to Veeler. Um, so today, we are live in our production environment um, with Veeler um, through HealthyWay. Um, it was a heavy lift. There's, while well, it's standardized, there's, there's a lot of legwork that needs to happen through that. Um, but it is live, and, and we are correlating patients um, at the individual, li individual level on both sides today. Blue button, you heard me talk about this um, from the, about SIM. This is a pilot that we, we, um, we started through SIM, where we would test um, getting blue button technology available to patients. Um, SIM funded this activity. Um, I talked last year, and you heard, I think, this morning about the issue about HIEs producing patient portals. Um, I don't need to go into that, but the reality is, is that meaningful use is driving patient portals through the EMRs. And so we don't want to get in the way of that. We want to help support it. Um, and so this, this, is, this is, was our first effort there. Um, this, is, this is a picture of the patient portal at Eastern Maine Healthcare Systems. You can see, you can barely see it, I'm sorry for the slide, but um, right where that arrow is pointing, it says click here to download your statewide record from Health InfoNet. This is in the patient portal that a patient would go in when they, when they receive services at Eastern Maine Healthcare Systems. And when they download that, it pulls down a CCD C32 from us in document format so the patient can use, use it. Um, we had 760 active patient portal users um, across three primary care practices in the pilot. Um, we had 95% successful downloads. We had some errors. Um, we learned that, that not, all, not all data is created equal through this one, not, and, and there were errors um, um, in, in, in the query and the correlation. Um, I can talk about that technically uh, later if you'd like. Um, but at, at overall, this was very successful. We, we received very positive feedback both from the provider community and the patient community. Um, and we've done a survey, now we're just aggregating those results. We've de we're developing a strategy right now in partnership with Eastern Maine to roll it out across their entire system, which is about 350,000 patients. Um, and then we're looking at our statewide strategy also. One other thing that we're doing now, getting to the comments of the commission earlier, um, is thinking beyond this. So this is, this is a way that we can get static data about what we have to the patient so that they can have a conversation with their provider about their data. 
But again, it's the medical data that we have, that the provider has. Um, it's not it's not necessarily um, anything that the patient's generating. And we really, really want to engage the patient in helping them submit data. Um, and I'm going to use a personal story. We all have them, as was said earlier, and I have one too. My daughter was diagnosed last fall with type 1 diabetes. She's five. Type 1 diabetes is a very difficult disease to manage because all of a sudden, I have to be a pancreas. My wife has to be a pancreas. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into insulin management. And there are, we have three different devices right now for my daughter. We have a, a continuous glucose monitor that is inserted in her body. We have an insulin pump that delivers insulin to her for every single carbohydrate that she intakes. And we have a glucometer, which we do the finger pricks to make sure that we're testing blood and, and, and all those data points are aligning so that we're giving appropriate medication dosing. Myself and my wife are doing the medication dosing. We have a diabetes center, and it's a world-class world diabetes center in Maine, but the reality is, is that, that her, diabetes, her insulin needs change every single day based on temperature, based on activity, based on hormones, and then also, then you've got to figure out all the carbs and everything that she's putting in her mouth to calculate insulin. That's a lot. Personally, I need data to make those decisions. And what's really fascinating is that when we went through this, it was totally overwhelming. Here, I work in the field. I work, I, I run a health information exchange. I see health data every day. This was completely overwhelming. And, and yet, and there were no tools available to me in September of last year for me to manage her data. There are now. This is a picture of a tool that I use right now. Um, that's on my phone. That's, her, that's every five minutes of her blood glucose level so I can see it. We get alarms on this so that she can go to school and have a normal life, but we can know what's happening to her. If she's hitting a low or she's hitting a high, I can pick up the phone and call the school nurse. This tool was developed in an open source manner by parents like me to get us data because nobody in the in industry had it. There's medical devices that we, we're, we're pirating data from the medical device manufacturers, but we're getting it out on our phones. And I'm able to now use this data along with data from the other three devices in another tool that I'm piloting with Stanford University to actually take it all and look at those trends so I can set her basal insulin rates. I can look at her carb to insulin ratios. I can, sense, I can set sensitivity levels. That's what I need to do, and that's what I need as a consumer. Personally, I'm, as Sean Alfreds, I'm a, I'm a young, I'm, I'm fairly young, I'm in, I'm, my, I'm, I'm in my 40s, I'm relatively healthy. I don't need access to my medical records every day. I don't need, I'm not going to go in there. I have two patient portals. I can tell you I've never logged into either one. But for my daughter, I log in on a regular basis. And if this information can get in there and be more accessible, then I can have a much more informed decision, um, conversation with my clinician, with my daughter's clinician, about her needs from, from, um, in managing this very complex and very challenging chronic disease. The incidence of type 1 diabetes has gone up 8% year over year for the last 10 years. This is a very difficult disease to manage. It's very costly. $35,000 a year. Right now, I calculated. If we did not have insurance, that would be that would, that would be almost impossible to manage. So I am just throwing this out there. This isn't something Health Infonet's doing, but it's something personally I'm very interested in. When we're bringing these conversations to the table. But it's something that I think we as a community need to think about. Engage the consumers where they need help. This is an example of where they need help and where we have technology and tools available to help them do better in managing illness. So going back to Health InfoNet, um, that was a little aside, but it's an important one in my opinion. Analytics, um, again, doing big data analytics on all this stuff, I mean, even taking that diabetes data, what I need to know is, is trends. What I need to understand is, is okay, so when, when my daughter's receiving a basal level, because she gets insulin all 24 hours, a little tiny bit, just to keep her highs from getting too high and, 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 and allow us to be able to manage the carbs. I need trends to understand how much basal insulin she needs every single day. And that has changed. In the last 12 months, we've made basal changes every other week. We also have sensitivity rates, which means when she's high, how do I bring her down fast without tanking her and making her go hypoglycemic? So you need to see those trends. Well, that's what big data is all about. That's what we're all talking about. Now, we're using it today to help physician practices identify risky patients, identify patients who are at risk for diseases, at risk for diabetes, at risk for AMI, at risk for stroke. But, you know, on the patient side, helping patients understand that and use this big data to actually identify those trends and develop, and develop technologies and tools for them, that's, that's even more valuable. And I guarantee you there's more money in that than there is in this. Because as a patient, I pay for this. And, and you think about it, everybody, I, I've seen five 
Apple Watches in this community here today. Just walking around, people wearing Apple Watches. Somebody, people pay $350 for a watch, um, but it's connected. It's connected to your phone and it's connected to the health kit. And there's opportunities to use that to our advantage, to both get data and provide data. So for us in analytics today, we're talking about aggregating all that patient data um, that we've got in the exchange. We're providing that out to general acute care hospitals. We're providing it out for ACO management and care management. That's our primary focus, getting care managers information they need so that they can engage with that patient. Um, and um, we're actually delivering predictive risk now that has has beat many tools that are in operation. We have, we've had Boost tools. Boost is a, a manual care management tool that's being used in, in the workforce to identify patients at risk through engagement and interview. Our tools, we, we put it up against it in a six-month pilot and found that our tools are identifying 75% more patients accurately for, for, for readmissions than that Boost tool was. This is, what, this is the power of big data, and I think we can go way further than we have. So clearly, using clinical data, thinking about the HIEs and the movement of data, we can use this to help inform practice. We can use this to help drive care management. We can use this to keep our patients healthier, and we can use it to engage patients. Getting the data in one place, as I said yesterday, we have too much data, but we're trying to make it real and trying to make it informative um, for the workflows that we're putting it in. And honestly, bringing multiple data sets together is important. We've increased our sensitivity statistically on the, on the risk model by adding in that claims data. Here's a paper that's on our website. You can see, you can see more and get, get some details on, on what those risk models are doing. We've got a new mission. We've got a new vision. Um, but we're really trying to refine our product infrastructure to take the HIE into the future, to make it more valuable and expand and enhance those services into workflow. So I, know I don't have much time. I want to give time for my colleagues here. But there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of opportunity. I really appreciate the, the ability to come here and talk to you all and learn from you as, all as well. So there's my contact info, and I'm happy to talk later about other things that we're doing at Health Info Net. Well, I'm so glad that I'm following Sean. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, California. In case anybody had questions about it, California is an odd bird. Um, like Maine, you could take most of the New England states and fit it inside California and have a little room left over. But unlike Maine, I'm not going to talk about a health information exchange across California. Uh, it's a very varied state with lots of at least uh, its inhabitants believe varied requirements for what they need in health IT. And therefore, it has health information exchanges that have been live since the mid-90s, as well as uh, some part of our membership um, that incorporated and are yet to go live incorporated in March of this year. So it's a huge uh, variability in experience. Um, the, health, the California Association of Health Information Exchanges is an association. We are a collection of community and enterprise health information organizations and stakeholders in the state that are interested in promoting uh, the sharing of health information. About a third of our membership is community HIOs, about a third is enterprise HIOs, and the enterprises in California are very much engaged with what's going on. And the balance is then uh, other stakeholders, payers, uh, uh, associations and committed individuals that are interested in promoting health information exchange and the sharing of health information. Um, what do we do? We really have three primary goals. First of all, we are an association, so we lend a single voice to California in responding to pilots and calls for information at the federal and at the state level. For instance, we responded to the interoperability roadmap, uh, the uh, federal HIT strategic plan, et cetera. The NPRMs that came out recently are looking at statewide pilots uh, for cases where it makes sense to have a serv service that's established at the state level rather than at a regional level. We're also a club. It's a place where um, uh, our members and the organizations that participate in KHI can come together and share experiences. Because as I said, there are some very good, mature, sound organizations that have been around and sharing information for a very long time and some very new organizations. And nobody should be forced to uh, reinvent the wheel. However, there's also a huge variety in what people are doing in California, uh, all the way from uh, organizations that are committed really to doing nothing but results delivery because that is what their customers want 
all the way to organizations that are doing automated alerts, uh, population health analytics, et cetera, for, for, for their communities as well. And it, it's a good environment where they can share experiences and, and, and learn from each other, and people actually do that. k uh, High was created, however, to provide uh, governance for statewide health information exchange in California. And it really started um, in early 2013, where the state government uh, that was recipient of this uh, ONC's um, high tech money uh, determined that it was not authorized to govern health information exchange statewide in California and would not seek authorization to do so. So it literally called up 15 old guys, threw them in a room, and said, You guys figure it out. And KHI was uh, effectively born that day. And so one of the uh, important goals that we continue to do is voluntary self-governance, the statewide health information exchange. In California, that's governed by a multi-party data sharing agreement among organizations that are sharing information across the organizational boundaries. So that's mostly the community HIOs or enterprises, hospital systems, et cetera and a very lightweight technical infrastructure that supports the policies and that multi-party data use agreement. And it's important to us that that be a very lightweight um, uh, technical infrastructure because KHI gets no support whatsoever from the state of California and all of our operational costs have to be carried on the backs of our members and there is no new money here. So that means that people have to see value uh, that is uh, uh, higher value than the cost that they're incurring to get those services, and that means we're trying uh, diligently to keep our costs down. It means the technical infrastructure there really enables trust, and that's what we're all about. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So what is KHI not? And this is really important. We are not the SDE in California, never have been. There is no SDE in California. We're also not sanctioned in any way by the state government in California. We operate voluntary self-governance without any regulator, regulatory authority. And I am still amazed, and I live out there, that this works. But it really happens because the folks in California have realized that they can deliver to their regions or their enterprises, but there's value in exchanging with their neighbors. It is no longer a business threat. It is a business advantage. And they really are interested in cooperating. And although I say that we do governance, I would say more than governance. We do coordination among folks so that they know what to expect of their neighbors and therefore how to exchange with them in a reasonable way. The bottom line, there is a business case for exchanging across these organizations, and that's why it's working in California. I said before that I was going to really talk about trust because I think that that is really what KHI is all about. If we can establish trust among these organizations, then they will move data and they will incur the costs associated with moving data because, as I said, there is a business case. And trust really has a whole bunch of different components to it. You need to understand that your conversation with another provider or a patient is not being overheard, that the information that you're talking about actually re uh, gets to the other end without being corrupted, either on purpose or accidentally, that you know who it is that you're talking about, that you know who you are talking to, that you have some information about the individual that you're exchanging information with, and their um, authorization to, to hear your conversation and participate in it. Uh, you need to know something about how the information will be used so that you can make decisions about whether it's authorized, and you need to have some uh, clue as to whether you have permission to have this conversation in the first place. Now, I would not clear, claim that the uh, interoperability roadmap is the magic um, document that's going to drive us all forward, but I think it provides an interesting framework to talk about trust and what we're doing in California. So. I've kind of used that as the structure here. So within California, we are engaged in dealing with standards. Standards start to ensure that your conversation is not being overheard and that you can trust the information you get. There are too many standards today with too many options and how they're implemented. We do not create new standards in California, but we are trying to coordinate how those standards are used among our organizations. Uh, I will say as an aside here, at least the folks in our membership in California are very concerned with the ongoing changes to certification program because we do not believe that certification is, is, is doing any great help to interoperability and is not making our lives easier as it forces people to continually upgrade their systems. But we do believe that good guidance in how you use existing, well-adopted, and well-implemented standards is an important part of, of good interoperability. 
We are specifically taking a look at patient matching. Anybody here in the room that's engaged in health information exchange knows that this is a problem. You hear a lot of people say that there are no mistakes when they do patient matching. The truth of the matter is, if that is true, then they're spending a great deal of time and effort making sure that it's true, because this is a difficult task, it is expensive, and in particular, one of the things that we're doing in California is we have a work group, part of the Knowledge Network in California, where we're talking about ways to really raise the bar. And that isn't about uni uh, uni unique um, statewide identifiers, it's not about uh, 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 standards and algorithms or uh, standards in the for, uh, data that we're exchanging, it's trying to come up with a new way to really identify patients uh, in a way that everybody can trust. Um, in dealing, we're, we're very much um, engaged in dealing with identity management among the providers that are part of the network. It's very important that you understand who it is that you're talking to and that you have assurance of, of what their identity is. We're sharing good policies and best practices there and making sure that all of our communities uh, adopt those. One of the big things that we're concentrating on is what is in the roadmap called resource location. It goes by a huge number of different names, but I think the bottom line is, is that especially with technologies like fire that you're gonna hear about tomorrow, it is no longer reasonable for us to know how to exchange information with everybody in the country. You just can't do that. Today, that might be only tens of thousands of direct addresses that you need to know in the state of California. Tomorrow, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of fire endpoints that pop up daily and you don't have any clue how to, how to locate them or how to use them. So an important part of how you use health information exchange in the future is going to be how do you locate those resources, how do you discover how to use them, and how do you move that forward. Uh, we have a large project in California that we call directory services that starts with direct addresses but is preparing for fire and other technologies like that as well. Um, if anybody's interested in participating with that, everything we do is wide open and I'd love to have other people um, uh, come along with us there. Um, patient preferences, we are not uh, developing a statewide um, uh, consent uh, database within California and don't see a need to do that. However, we are looking very seriously at how to best uh, exchange sensitive information while complying with requirements of the state and federal level. Uh, it's one of those good areas where there's good uh, opportunity for education and sharing of best practices to move that forward. And there's a lot of behavioral health information in California that is being shared and it's not shared on a private behavioral health network, but is actually in, in, uh, integrated in with some of the enterprises and community exchanges in California. And finally, authorization, just you need to understand something about how the information is going to be used and the identity of the person that's using it and their permissions to have the conversation all wrapped up together. And in California, we are very much dedicated to the concept of local autonomy, that every organization, if they get all of that information, can make good judgments on whether they should be sharing information or not whether the intended recipient is authorized. And so we're adopting uh, practices um, that have been tested and true in California and across the country and standards that are supported at the national level. Um, I said before that for us, governance is really coordination. It's not trying to insist that you do things our way. And in fact, one of the reasons that KHI is working is that we don't tell any of our organizations what they need to do inside their own borders, only when they're talking to their neighbors. So it's, it's important to us that people be able to operate their own businesses and they be sustainable and we are merely enabling to get across uh, to, to the folks next door. And the model, I, I'll say this again, the model of voluntary self-governance without regulatory authority is working in California and I'm still amazed at that every day I go to work. Uh, one of the things that is important, as I said before, is that there needs to be a good business case. If there is not a reason to exchange information, all of this cool stuff we're doing is for not, nobody will care. It is not a, if you build it, they will come. They absolutely will not. And I'll uh, end with that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm in control. Okay. My name is Daryl Holler. I'm Director of Product Management at NICE, New York eHealth Collaborative. 
And today, I uh, just wanted to talk to you about what New York eHealth Collaborative is. I'm, product, I'm in product management, so I'm going to focus more about some of the products and services that we deliver. Um, NICE is a not-for-profit organization that we're looking to improve health care throughout the state of New York. We promote adoption and the use of electronic um, medical records, and we build and manage the SHINee, which is the State Health Information Network for New York. Um, it helps share medical records across the state of New York. And also, we're here to develop statewide policies, um, convene stakeholders, and we're the, we are the state-designated entity from the, the uh, Department of Health. Our three major tenants are better healthcare, better health, and reduced costs using healthcare information technology. So I'm in product management. What I do every day is identify, scope, and release um, products. And what we focus on is stakeholder needs, analyzing technology, and then also doing market analysis. In New York, this marketplace looks, it's, it's large. Um, there's a lot of hospitals, almost 60,000 or 70,000 physicians, 20 million patients, and um, 70 million plus visits per year. So there's a lot of volume and it's very decentralized. And upstate New York is different from downstate New York. Downstate is very dense. 12 million of those 20 million people are downstate. And the, the way the uh, insurance coverage is, it it's varies um, dip greatly. So downstate, you have a strong presence. Upstate, it's the opposite. The way that we've been structured in New York, we're in, we have Rios, all right? We're, we're separated by region. Um, regional Health Information Organizations, it was formed out of a, a HEAL grant that started in 2004, I believe it was awarded in 2006. And what that grant, and the, there were several of them up through 2014, those grants wanted to implement a 21st century health IT infrastructure across the state. And these RIOs, they convene all of the participants and, and health organizations within their region. And they allow them to share data within their region, but not across the region. At the heart of a RIO, you have a health information exchange software. You have a patient database, their, their MPI, their master patient index. And then that RIO is going to help coordinate all of the traffic, the data that goes in between all of the participants of that RIO. They also offer um, business operations. So when it comes down to MPI management, how um, patients are going to match within that RIO, the RIO um, handles that or helps them with those processes as well. So patients in New York consume care differently. Upstate is very wide open. Most likely, for the most part, patients are going to see doctors that are just in their region. They're not going to cross borders too much. Downstate, you can be crossing borders all of the time. And we, you know, there's a lot of use cases. Some of the, the common ones that we look at, a patient lives in Brooklyn. Um, they may have a doctor there. They work in Manhattan. The primary care physician may be there and then they go to a conference and they get sick or something like that. And that doctor needs to see the full record. All of those doctors want to see the full record. And what happens, you know, we want a connected healthcare infrastructure. The U.S. railroad system is an example of that. You know, it was built in a privatized way, in, in more regional, very localized. But once they adopted to standards, then the trains could flow. And it really stimulated the economy after that. So, if we connect the New York healthcare infrastructure, um, what would that look like here? So that's where the SHINee comes in, the State Health Information Network for New York. And this is at the direction of the New York State Department of Health. And it, right now there are nine RIOs. When it started, there were more RIOs, but there's been a lot of consolidation in the market. So there are nine RIOs who control their regions. Adoption is this adoption is of the uh, hospitals and the uh, provider, the small practices, to those RIOs. This data is a little bit stale. Um, in the hospitals, you're looking more above 80 percent. Um, and the physicians are where we're, the smaller physicians, sink private practices, are where we're focusing on. That's more 20 to 25 percent adoption to the RIOs. Um, but we want to get that higher. Adoption to the RIOs means greater adoption to the shiny. So I'll talk about a key, few key services of the of State Health Information Network. Provider Search, which is our state patient record lookup, which is launching this year. Patient, patient Search, which is the New York um, patient portal, 
again, um, launching this year. It's in pilot right now. We have direct exchange alerts and subscriptions, which are provided at a regional basis, but are going to be going statewide. And then we have some services with practice trans transformation. So at a high level, RIOs are connected. A doctor wants to get information about their patient, no matter where they are throughout the state. A doctor at a participating hospital sends a request through. That request goes to the RIO. It goes through um, the Shiny using statewide patient record lookup. We forward it on to all of the, any of the other hospitals that have information about that patient. They respond. They create a CCD in real time, and then we forward that on to the to the um, to the querying QE querying querying RIO. We promote standards. We're built on a service-oriented architecture. We leverage the integrating the healthcare enterprise standards, and we enforce that the other, any participants on our network adhere to those standards as well. And we're harmonized with, when we did our functional spec last year, June, we made sure to harmonize with the healthy way standards so that at some point soon we could um, hop on that network, network as well. This slide is a little bit technical, just saying that we are building a secure network to make sure that the PHI is protected. So the information that's available are the general information that you would find to be available in an EHR. Diagnosis, encounter, um, encounters, medications, all that t same type of information will be available across state. But the information that's not there, we don't store the, the clinical information in our statewide MPI, I mean, or our statewide systems. It's a federated model. We do store the demographic information that comes across. So we're an MPI of MPIs. So not only our Shiny is a network of networks, but our MPI is an MPI of the Rio MPIs. So the Rios can match patients from facilities that exist within their Rio and say, hey, these two people at these hospitals are the same person. We will look at patients in different Rios and match them at the statewide level. Um, again, this is just saying um, what was said earlier, that it requires governance. We have to get a lot of adoption agreement on how we're going to remediate patients. If we say these people aren't really the same person, we have to actually use the same algorithms as um, all of our real partners. So it takes a lot of um, work and policies and procedures. This slide is just saying that we are using a conformance testing tool. Um, it was, we developed a, an ITT test tool to make sure that our, all of our calls adhere to the, um, to the standards, to the IHE standards. And we um, created this tool in collaboration with IHE and the HIMSS. So what's next? We feel strongly that you know, we're launching this at the end of the year. Once the network is there, th things can be built on top of it. Um, it we have plans um, in the future to develop an API so that it's not just me and my team figuring out what services and products we can build on top of this, but it's third party vendors that can be working with the Rios to say, we have an idea to match this data up with something else, and they can start to get access to the clinical data with consent, of course. We also have a patient portal. Um, the primary objective here is patient-driven healthcare. It's about aggregating data and abstracting it. Um, it also allows the patient to um, send secure direct messages to the provider. This one is in pilot right now and will be launched at the end of the year or before the end of the year. And we really think that this helps with patient sa safety as well because the, the patient is gonna be the one who knows that, hey, this information is not mine. This is incorrect and they can do something about it. It leverages our networks. It's, it's a part, it talks to the shiny, and it adheres to all of the standards as well. Um, right now, all of the Rios started, they've had patient portals in the past. So our first iteration of our patient portal is more of a Rio-centric portal. It requires manual identity proofing. Person's at a doctor's office, they go into the, into the office, and they sign up for it at the, um, at the front desk. Going forward, what's in development right now is to make something that's more Rio agnostic. So we have to build it first and then try to make sure the Rios are willing to move to that because they do want their own look and feel. They want their own thing. Um, but it's going to have what we're building out right now by the end of the year. It's going to have electronic identity proofing. It will have, um, and then once we know you're you, okay, I'm Daryl Holler, I'm coming to the, um, to the patient portal, then we have to figure out are we matching you to the correct clinical records? So we're going to be implementing something called clinical identity proofing as well. This year as well, we're going to be um, allowing 
parents, guardians to pull, um, to interact with the New York State and the city immunization registries so that they can print, view and print the official records for the immunization registry so that they don't have to go to the doctor's office to print something out. And after that, we feel that, you know, what's next? You know, we're thinking about these things now. Um, it's really about the Internet of Things integration and making sure that, you know, um, we can mash up data with other um, things such as Fitbit and device-oriented data. Uh, I'll speed up a little bit. So we have already have statewide um, direct message exchange. Uh, this was launched uh, last year. And it allows secure connection between providers and through the patient portal from the patients to the providers. Our patient notifications, which is our alerts and subscriptions, that is, right now it's regional. That's offered by the Rios to their customers, but we're, we have a pilot between two QEs. Um, we call them qualified entities, also Rios, um, that's going on right now, which allows them to um, have alerts generated in a, in a Rio, which they're not part of, and get sent cross community to the doctor in a different Rio. And eventually, that will be going statewide as well. And then practice transformation services, um, we have the Rec Center Regional Extension Center, which works with the doctor's offices, the smaller guys, to make sure that they can adopt and understand what this technology is. So I'm almost done, and um, this just talks about where we came from. Starting in 2006, we've been primarily grant-funded, um, but we know it's all about sustainability. As of last year, we got put onto the statewide budget and um, we're part of the gov governor's budget, so that, that's a different way to get funding. Um, and we're also looking at different um, avenues in terms of being a public utility. And the good thing with being on the statewide budget is that it helps the Rios, because the Rios also get money from the statewide budget, gives them incentive that they have to conform with the data use agreements and to do what is necessary to be a, a, a member of the SHINee. So I'll just leave you with recommendations after we've been working on this for about 16 months. Um, adopt the standards. Incentivize all of your stakeholders to work together. Um, it creates the trust between all of the partners. Think big. Um, put in the proposals for the, for the big money. Implement on a cyclical basis. Try to do things that you can bite off and create trust. You know, create wins. Do things on a smaller scale. Create trust from the um, stakeholders that you're working with and then you know, next time they'll be willing to go for something bigger. Build a strong team and keep that team intact throughout the process. We've had, for the most part, about 40 to 50 people on our team between the HIE vendors, the Rios, and our staff, and our vendors that have built out the statewide um, network involved um, for the last 14 months or so. And it's not, may not be all the same people, maybe a CEO who started off at the functional spec, or I mean CIO at the fun functional spec phase, but now it's the director who's reporting to that CIO, so it's within the same team. But keeping that team consistent really helps. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Aaron Seib. I, I happen to be the, uh, the CEO of the National Association for Trusted Exchange, and I get to travel quite a bit. Actually, this is the fifth day that I've come and been able to share with folks what we do at Nate. And it's a huge honor to be able to come back and see how far Michigan has come in the last two years. Um, I, I, I just want to thank you, Sean, for sharing your story about your daughter. I was working at the National Cancer Institute 15 years ago, running 300 clinical trials in parallel for the, clinical, for the cancer treatment evaluation program. Uh, my son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. So I decided to quit working on that and really focus on trying to get to the point where we could get data that would have an impact on his life and the next generation's life. So Dr. Freeman, your work in the learning health system is very much a motivation and, and I think it's, it's uh, a patient spring that we're having to see so many people coming together talking about how do we enable the patient to be engaged? How do we enable the patient to actually contribute what only they know? Um, autism, much like diabetes, is a, a condition that is, varies from day to day, and it varies from child to child. Um, today we have basically trial and error medicine for kids with autism, and if we don't start capturing that data and sharing that data, 
to the point where we can one day use the phenotypic data that will be available to help improve outcomes, shame on us. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here on this panel because I get to represent a number of people who have helped us get here, helped Nate get here, including uh, Jeff Livesay, who has been a huge supporter of Nate, a member of our board, uh, Dr. Cothran, who is our CTO. Um, I will spend just a few seconds going through some slides here uh, because I really want to hear your questions about how can engaging patients improve your mission, you know, improve the likelihood of success for your stakeholders. Very briefly, most folks, I hope, have heard of Nate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we've produced as far as a trust framework. Um, obviously, everybody has been talking about the benefits of consumer access. And I think one of the things that Nate's really working on is to make that access more fluid so that the consumer can get the data directly from their patient portals, their providers, um, their pharmacies, and then do what they would like with it. I was at the uh, Data Palooza conference in DC very recently talking with folks about how consumers can contribute to clinical research, which obviously having my NCA background is a big part of what has motivated me uh, to continue running up against the toughest problems that we find. And today, I, you know, I'm a very blessed man to stand on a, on a panel with guys like this who kind of chop those, those problem sets down like uh, Jimi Hendrix with the side of their hand. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'll talk a little bit about how it works, which I think most folks in the room are familiar with the technical infrastructure around direct and PKIs, and uh, hopefully get you guys to ask some questions or tell us what else we can be doing to move probably the most important mission forward, which is improving outcomes for patients. Very briefly, who is Nate? Nate is a not-for-profit that we incorporated in DC on May 1st, 2013. Uh, we are all volunteers. None of us take any, any money to make this happen. We have the good fortune of having very forward-thinking people who really prioritize what I work on when we do bring funds together to make things happen. Um, and they started us down the patient path two years ago. So it's been a real blessing to be the guy who sort of helps facilitate that and pull the best from everyone to sort of get to the point that I hope that we have a learning health system that the next generation of kids, the next generation of cancer patients, the next generation of people with metabolic problems don't have to experience what we're all experiencing today. Nate has established a, a, a trust bundle, essentially a mechanism that allows secure exchange between covered entities and consumers. Different regulatory domains apply to covered entities that then apply to consumers. We've worked very hard to develop a, a, a policy profile. Am I going too slow? Uh, at the end of the day, the takeaway is we make it easier for providers to share their data with consumers, their patients, so that the consumers can do what they want with it, like Sean showed with us. Some of the things he's doing today, he's pirating that data. He's literally pirating that data. The device manufacturer probably doesn't want him to have that data. And that's wrong. That's just, and dude, I'll, I'll, I'll fly the black with you and pirate anything that we can. Uh, it goes without saying, why does this matter? I mean, there's been a lot of research. We've seen a lot of different people talking about it. An engaged patient has better outcomes. You know, better outcomes, highest quality costs is actually the lowest cost, I'm sorry, the highest quality care has typically been shown to produce the lowest cost. We've spent um, over two years, we've engaged, I think over 300 people in producing our current set of policies and procedures that bring together the consumer facing organizations that enable providers to share health information with consumers who actually improve their outcomes, improve their quality of life as a result. We will continue to improve this as we get feedback from you guys about what it will take. Uh, we are very fortunate at this point. We went live March 1st. A number of the EMR vendors that are, are gatekeepers to some degree, uh, because we're also quiet, I think. And rather than demanding it, we, we sort of like wait till we get permission to share. Um, but more and more providers are starting to recognize the importance of sharing with their patients as a result of health reform and value-based payments. So we expect that the demand from consumers and providers to continue to increase, where we will hear, where the EMRs will hear from their customers, the docs, that I need to share with my consumers. Hopefully, um, Nate is an open organization. 
we participate, we establish uh, crowdsourcing activities, we do public commenting, um, we do what it takes to get all of you guys involved, and I hope that you will in our next round. Today, I'm very happy to say that uh, I think it's been four months now. We have uh, seven entities, including friends from No More Clipboard that are here, Get Real Health, that are part of our trust bundle. We will continue to add more. When I was in DC, I was at four different conferences in DC. Uh, there are a plethora of tools coming to market that will be based on top of this platform, similar to something that Sean has built, some innovative and, and entrepreneurial people bringing specific tools that are really important to particular phases in your life. So we, we think about having the ability to provide choice to consumers and then being able to in, um, interoperate with, for example, one that really got me very excited was a, a pregnancy app. Like nobody, I work a lot with the DOD and the VA, they don't think about building pregnancy apps a lot, but their dependents are pregnant. They have hopefully continue to have great children and protect our country. And we need to provide them the platforms and those tools that preserve their privacy and ensure their optimal care. And of course, again, the PKI infrastructure. You know, this is a starting point for us. Very much motivated to see this being matured through different modes of exchange, query and retrieve, as supported by many of the state regional activities. Looking forward to fire in the next three or four years. But we can't wait. We need to do this now. We need to get the data to consumers as soon as possible. That's all I have. Thank you. Another panel in Under the Wire. Thanks to Daryl's 12 New York Minutes. That was fast. And uh, what Aaron showed you, Nate Blue Button for Consumers, is very real. At the start of Shannon Sonnenberg Wing's panel, she's going to show you a video on how you can get your PHI from your primary care provider's EHR to your PDA. Okay? We're going to show you that video. It's in a only few meaningful minutes. if it's meaningful to me. <laughs> I wore a shirt like that to my doctor at least. So. <laughs> okay, so we have time for questions. Yes. This is a question for New York. Um, I'm curious, you said one of the important things is um, to have incentives in place for the different RIOs to, to work together and collaborate. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about what those incentives might be. Oh, yeah, of course. T-shirts. So um, as part of the um, being on the statewide budget and, and getting money from the gov governor's office, there was a, a qualified, they call it the QIPA, Qualified Entity Participation Agreement. Um, and the, the QEs, or the RIOs, are certified um, before they can join the Statewide Health Information Network. And they must be, and the DOH gets the report from the Auditing committee, committee, and they must pass before they can be allowed to exchange data with the other participants. So they get funding as well from the, uh, the Department of Health. Um, so that's one level of incentive. But Jen, then other incentives is, you know, let the data flow. Make sure that, you know, some, you know before we started asking people to let the data flow, some, some Rio said, oh, my security policies are more stringent than others, so I'm not going to go down, to, I'm gonna, not going to reduce them because then I'll be less secure. Um, so what we did, we came in and we said, look, Let's all get into a room, work together, figure out what really, what level do we really need to be at. So there was incentive there for everybody to say, you know what, I've given input into these. I agree that, that these, um, these standards are um, the right standards to, to meet. And if everybody does it, then everybody gets the value from it. We have time for more questions. You've got some national experts and leaders here. Don't squander this opportunity. start asking questions. All the way in the back. <laughs> what are your guys' honest thoughts on fire? Well, we heard from Rim's a, thoughts. From a practical. <laughs> Love to well, hear elaboration from Rim. Yeah, um, I, so I am, I am cautiously optimistic 
you know, one of the things that I think is that we, we need a path to standards that allow detailed access to information, um, a big care summary that describes everything that uh, is known about you is not necessarily the right way to exchange information. And so I think FIRE has a lot of promise. Um, but I'm cautious because uh, there is a history, especially uh, uh, as part of certification and meaningful use, to drive standards before they're ready for prime time. And FIRE is a, is, is a good work in progress. And so it's just if we give it time to mature, I think that it may uh, be something that is, that is truly revolutionary. And we're preparing our way for, for FIRE. But. Hey, Rim, that services directory that you mentioned, would that be capable of managing 100,000 FIRE endpoints? Is that what it's? And, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we're looking for, is that, you know, today when most people are thinking about a registry of information on how do you exchange information with somebody, they're, they're really talking about a directory of direct addresses. And, okay, that's useful today, and we have to do something that's useful today. Don't get me wrong. But um, we are building something so that, yes, if you are trying to find um, uh, blood glucose data on a particular patient, that there is a mechanism that you can use to find the fire uh, service endpoint that can get that information for you. And that's, that's what the resource location is all about. Perfect. And um, I, I just, Aaron. you know, um, to quote a famous American, uh, any means necessary. So it may be three to five years from now that FIRE will be useful in getting data from uh, covered entities to consumers. We can't wait that long, but we should be anticipating it and building toward it. I think in the video, you'll see how we can use the extant systems that are in place for exchange, including direct. Any certified EHR in the country should be able to send uh, a direct address uh, message to a consumer who has a Nate Trust Bundle member. Did you want to add on fire? Um, I'll just add briefly. I, I agree with both of my colleagues over here. I, I think the challenge that we see with standards is, is that it takes a long time to adopt. Um, we're dealing with a lot of big, very expensive IT systems that we're looking to pull data from. And so it's very exciting to see something like this come forward with so much promise. Um, but the reality is, is it won't get implemented unless there's a real business reason for that. And I think that's all of our roles around the tables that we're sitting at is to, is to bring forward that, that business case in all, in all of this work. Because if there is a business case, it'll get adopted. Um, but if we're going to adopt it, we also have to put, put forward the resources to do so. If you want to learn more about FIRE, and yes, this is going to be a shameless plug, we have some of the, the nation's leading experts on FIRE and Argonaut lined up for tomorrow. So please come to the workshop. Another question? Over here. Good afternoon. Uh, Hugh Gillinson, Data Motion HISP, by way of full disclosure, uh, HISP for the Bronx Rio. Interested in uh, the gentleman from New York's ideas on DISRUP and other funded programs that are going to drive uptake of all of these great products that you've spent a lot of time working on. Yeah, um, you know, we have, we have a team at uh, NICE that's working on DISRUP right now. Um, we, have, we, have a lot of in, we have a lot of people working on this. Um, I'm not directly involved with DISRUP, um, but we're going to be spending a lot of time in that area. I don't have a lot of information as to what we're going to be doing on that, though. Hugh, I heard a lot of docs at Data Blues and a couple of the other conferences talking about as they take on risk, especially 2016 when we expect 50% of Medicare payments to be value-based, and then by 2018, 80%, uh, it's going to be very critical for them to be able to engage consumers. Time for one more question. Here we go. So one of the things that New York does, at least how I look at it, that the shiny represents the patients, right? And the patients are the taxpayers. So New York has been lucky enough to get funding from state and federal governments and aligning with DISRIP, which is what that gentleman just spoke about, which is another state initiative um, that kind of aligns and influences and incentivizes the providers to connect with the shiny. What I'm wondering from the other states above, and this is probably not the easiest question, is are you looking, you know, when you're looking at sustainability, are you looking at kind of um, educating those patients and those taxpayers to eventually, um, you know, leverage the policy and maybe funding from state to influence the providers to connect to your HIE? Um, and again, I know that's probably not an easy question. <laughs> I mean, 
Okay, so I'll start. In, in Maine, um, we, we have a subscription model for the health information exchange. It's 100% sustainable. We charge our provider, but the provider community is paying the payload. Um, as far as getting state funds, you know, it's very political, right? So, you know, depending on, on who's in office and what the political stance regarding, um, regarding state funding is, we, we have various relationships. We've gotten a lot of state funding and our state has been very generous. Our state is represented on our board. Again, it's about the community. I think, I think the challenge is, is that it's, it's about developing that business proposition, that value proposition to the consumer. Still today, as we've heard around this room, we, consumers don't quite understand what it is that we all do for a living. Um, and, and that's the challenge. And, and until the consumer is empowered with their information, can actually get access to that information in a usable way, it's really hard to have that conversation. Um, I, I think, I don't know of any other, any HIEs that don't have consumer advisory committees. We've had one for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they're very active, but that same conversation comes up day in and day out. Thank you. Okay, out of respect for Shannon and our next panel, we're going to hear the video. I think that's it for questions for this group. Please give it up for our guests from other states. Thank you.